Thanks, Miss Amanda. Thanks, helpers. What beautiful candles those were. All right, we're starting uh, a series in the season of Advent now, and uh, appropriately reading from the book of Isaiah, a common uh, book to, to read from during this season. So I'll be reading to you uh, words that may sound very familiar to many of you from Isaiah's second chapter, starting with verse 1. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be raised above the hills. All nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, as you probably heard, this is uh, the beginning of the church year. Church calendar begins with the first Sunday of Advent. It's pretty close to the calendar year that we observe, but it's always nice to think of this time of year as, as a new beginning, a starting point for all of us. I don't know about you, but usually about this time, it feels like a new beginning is in order, and so we begin our season of preparations, and we talk about that a good deal. Preparation is sort of the word theme for the month. We did a lot of preparation. Thank you for those of you who stuck around last Sunday and helped decorate the sanctuary. It looks beautiful. Thank you for those of you who, who made this uh, backdrop possible. Um, thank you for those who let us come uh, pillage your furniture and your rug collection for, for this as well. Uh, but we wanted to have a, a homey feel, uh, a cozy feel. We wanted to bring uh, the living room of the church right into your living rooms. And uh, now that the kids are out of the room, I think it's safe to say, too, that if you want to use this stuff, this furniture during worship and sit in these areas, you're welcome to do that, too. Uh, so uh, please take advantage of that. But we, that's what we wanted to do, and it was all about this attitude of preparation and, and readiness. And we talk about preparation because that's really the spirit of, of this season and what we're gearing toward. And when we choose texts like this one from 2 Isaiah, we have to go back to a time period that in some ways was very far removed from our current situation and in some ways very similar. The prophet Isaiah speaks to us in the first third of the book of Isaiah, and then we move into somebody else writing in Isaiah's name in the second third, and then somebody else still in the third third. And so when you study Isaiah as, as one of the larger books in the Bible, there's first, second, and third Isaiah, even though it's combined into one book. And in first Isaiah, we're actually hearing from this ancient prophet who's speaking at a set point in time, and he is looking, uh, he's preaching from the city of Jerusalem, and he says, I see the enemies on our borders. I fear danger creeping in from all sides. I see things going not as God would want it for God's people. The city is in some ways okay, but for other people it's, it's a desperate place. There's great disparities between haves and have-nots. We believe that God has given us a set of instructions, but we're not following it very well. And so this is the role of the prophet, is to, to speak truth to power, to inform the people that things are not as God desires them to be and to help them to correct course. And even in the midst of him sort of bringing in all of this doom and gloom and bad news, he also shares these words about a future-oriented time when there will be a different kind of deliverance where a messianic figure will come in and will, will save the day somebody that God will appoint as a fixer to set things right again. And so there is hope even in the midst of despair. There is light even in the darkest of times. And so that's sort of the context for where we begin the book of Isaiah. And it's the context for how we think about Advent. We know 
that we are working towards Christmas Eve. We know that there is light coming, and these are the dark days, literally and perhaps metaphorically. And we are working towards something that we are preparing our hearts for. We talk about let every heart prepare him room. We talk in terms of these, these poetic, kind of fluffy, metaphorical ideas. But here's the inconvenient truth, I think, about Advent. When we talk about preparation and readying ourselves for the birth of the Messiah, we're talking about something that already happened. We're talking about something that happened 2,000 plus years ago. The birth of Jesus took place already. So then I think we have to ask ourselves, if we are supposed to be preparing ourselves for the birth of Jesus, we either have to think one of two things. One, we have to be talking about Christ's return, the second coming of Jesus, which we could be talking about some, but that's really not where Advent is geared toward us thinking. Or we have to play make-believe that Christmas hasn't happened yet, and we are to role-play ourselves into the story. And that seems inauthentic, doesn't it? But do you see the dilemma here? Prepare your heart for the birth of Jesus, but that happened. So we're pretending that it hasn't, and we're going to just reenact it, or we're going to do the nativity, or we're going we're to sing these stories as if we're hoping for this. That doesn't sort of sit right with me. And sometimes I'm more content to sort of sweep that theological conundrum under the rug, but this year I've sort of been wrestling with that. What does that mean? Then what are we actually preparing for? What are we supposed to be about in Advent if the birth of Jesus has already happened? And what is it that we are supposed to be hoping for? What is this hope all about as we light the hope candle, as we talk about the thrill of hope, to quote, O Holy Night? What is it that we are hoping for exactly? First of all, I don't think we need to be pretending. I don't think that Advent should be about make-believe, about getting ourselves into the mindset of thinking like, let's pretend that the birth of Jesus hasn't happened yet. Instead, we give thanks for the fact that it did happen, that the incarnation took place, and that we can live our lives into this story in a different way. And I, I was reading a book uh, by Brian Zond, and I've quoted him several times in the past year. He's one of my new favorite Christian authors. But he wrote uh, this, and, and I, it really captivated my attention. And I think he just he, he hit the nail on the head. And he says this, Christians, by virtue of their baptism, belong to the age to come. Whether or not the kingdoms of the fallen world acknowledge the lordship of Christ is irrelevant to us. We who confess that Jesus is Lord are obligated to live according to the dictates of Christ's kingdom here and now. For the baptized, Isaiah's days to come arrived with Christ. Isaiah's days to come arrived with Christ. So he's saying the exact same thing here. Let's not play pretend that Jesus hasn't come. Let's celebrate the fact that he did come. But because of that, then what is our response? We then have to respond to that. We live our lives differently because of that. If we are following what we say we believe, if we are honoring the vows that were made on our behalf and we confirmed about our baptism, if we count ourselves among the Christian family tree, if we refer to ourselves as disciples, the body of Christ, the church family, then let's do it. Let's get about the business of being Christ followers. Let's get about the business of being the church together. Let's be disciples. It's time to put it into motion now. And the challenge for us, the problem I think that we face, is that we fail individually and collectively in our response. 
And I'm not, look, this is, this is the first Sunday in Advent. This is not a come heavy on everybody kind of Sunday. But at the same time, I want to say that clearly my life, your life, the community, and the world is not as it should be. This is not how God envisioned us to be. This is not the vision that Jesus cast when he talked about the coming of the kingdom. This is not the vision that the disciples had in the early church of what it meant to be the body of Christ. Now, I'm not saying we're doing a terrible job. I'm just saying that if you look around, we're not there yet. We are a work in progress. We've still got room to improve, right? I think we can agree on that. But the thing that I value so, so much about our faith, one of the things that I value most, is that Jesus reminds us that in our faith, there is always the opportunity to have a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance, an infinite chance, right? We get to do it over again. We get a new day, we get a new start, we get a new beginning, we get a new year in Advent every year. So maybe the focus this year in our preparations is less about let our hearts prepare room for the birth of a baby Jesus, let us prepare our homes with decorations and gift giving, but maybe instead the preparation needs to be centered on what do I need to do, what do we need to do as a church, what do we need to do as the church universal to be the people of the kingdom that Jesus talked about. Maybe this is the opportunity for us for a reset. If we are preparing not for baby Jesus, but to live into the vision that Jesus cast for us, then now we have something to aim at, don't we? We have something that we can work toward. We have something that we can say, these are the ways that I need to correct my life. And look, I don't think I've been a terrible person, and I don't believe you have either. But there are certainly ways when I examine my heart and I examine my conscience, I examine my soul, and I know that I can do better. And I know that Jesus invites me to do better. And I know that as a church we can do more. And I know that as the big church, we have a ways to go. And until we live into the vision of the kingdom that Jesus described, then perhaps Advent needs to be that reset. Advent is the beginning of a new year. It's a chance for us to prepare ourselves for how we are going to do different differently in the coming year. And because we have that opportunity again and again and again, that doesn't weigh heavy on my heart. It uplifts me with hope. And I hope you feel the same. Because Advent, if we are honest about it, if we're sincere in what we are talking about and we're believing, we recognize that while we sing about peace and we sing about joy and we sing about the coming of Christ, we know that we have some onus in that too. We bear responsibility because Christ gives us that responsibility. And because of that now, we have a chance to go out and to do differently again. There is hope in that fresh start. There is hope in that reset. And this time of preparation is an opportunity for us to begin to be the church and the kingdom that Christ calls us to be. Will you pray with me?